So today we're glad to have Dr. Ashwin Yanker uh, from King's College London. The title is uh, Iwasawa Main Conductor in Families, please. Great. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for to Dan and for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, and I'm sorry that I couldn't give it the first time. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had to unexpectedly drive halfway across the UK for no good reason. <laughs> so, um, Right, so that being said, um, today I'm going to talk about some things that I've been thinking about recently and a conjecture that I've been trying to, to formulate, um, which is an Iwasawa main conjecture for modular form in piatic families. So for people who might not be super familiar with Iwasawa theory, I wanted to start by giving an analogy in the function field setting uh, for the kind of statement that Iwasawa theory or Iwasawa main conjectures um, attempt to make. Uh, so I'll give this this motivation just for one slide, and then I'll I'll talk about Iwasawa theory in, in the number field context. So the the analogy comes from the vague conjectures, and this is one of this is one of um, Iwasawa's original uh, motivations for making the conjectures the way that he did. So for this, fix two prime numbers L and P, which are distinct, uh, and fix a smooth projective curve of genus G over um, a finite field with L elements, uh, and let J denote its Jacobian. So then the theorem, which is part of the Vey conjectures, um, I think for curves it was originally proven by Vey, says that if you take the zeta function of this curve, so this is um, this is some analytic function, some complex analytic function, which somehow knows about, you know, whose, whose power series coefficients know about the, the number of points uh, of x when you um, enlarge the base field. And so this is a priori some analytic object, but it turns out that this is equal to the zeta function for p1, which is given by uh, this denominator, essentially. And the eigenvalues of the L, the Frobenius at L, um, acting on the piatic tape module of the Jacobian. So the Frobenius at L is a topological generator of the Galois group of uh, FL bar over FL. And these alpha i's, right? So I mean, yeah, this top part corresponds to this determinant. So yeah, so it somehow relates uh, some analytic data from this you know, point counting on the curve to some algebraic information uh, in the Jacobian. So right, so Iwasawa formulated related conjectures for a number field. So I want to kind of just go back and forth and give us a, a short dictionary uh, to see how things correspond. So in the function field case, something like x, the smooth projective curve, is replaced by something like spec of the ring of integers of a number field. Um, right, and then the function field of the curve is corresponds to the number field, uh, as the analogy suggests. Then in Iwasawa theory, I mean, you can think about what should correspond to the Galois group of the base field, right? So, I mean, if you take FL, you can adjoin all the, you, know, you can take all the finite extensions and you get FL bar, um, which has a topological generator given by Frobenius. And somehow the, the point is that what you're really doing when you adjoin these, when you take finite extensions is you're adjoining roots of unity. And so Iwasawa's idea was, you know, if you take the, like, if you start with F, you could, you could think about taking the, um, let's say the absolute Galois group of F, but somehow this, I mean, this, you know, or some, some sort of intermediary thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, somehow this can end up being too big if you're not careful about how you choose your extension. So in some sense, the correct thing, and I'll, I'll sort of get into, you know, how this relates to the piatic story in a second, is the extension you get of F by adjoining the P power roots of unity in the, uh, the number field F. Okay. So then similarly, right, I, I had um, this L for Benius acting on the tape module of the Jacobian. And similarly, you should have the Galois group of this extension, which is supposed to correspond to this, you know, this uh, this absolute Galois group, acting on something that should be like the tape module of the piatic tape module of, of the Jacobian, or you know, in other words, something that should be like the p part of some space of, of divisors classes on you know on this uh, algebraic object. Okay, so precisely the kind of thing that you're interested in is the inverse limit of the p parts of the class groups of the finite extensions f mu p to the n. So I take f. I adjoin the p to the nth roots of unity. I take the class group, I take its p CLO subgroup, and then these form an inverse system, and I take the inverse limit. And somehow this should be thought of as kind of the, the analogous thing in the number field case. Okay. Um, right. So then, you know, having made this analogy, then you expect that, uh, like in the theorem, which related, you know, some Galois action on this tape module to the zeros or, you know, to some analytic function. The point is that the structure of this thing should be related to zero, the zeros of some sort of zeta function. Okay, but since this ends up being a piatic story, you need in the end uh, a piatic zeta function. And so I'm going to talk about this on the next slide when I make this more precise. Okay, so 
let's focus on the case uh, spec Z. So I'm just the, the sort of number field that I'm uh, going to give an example of the newest our main conjecture for is just the rational numbers. So the appropriate zeta function initially you might suspect is the Riemann zeta function, right? The usual Riemann zeta function. Okay, so <laughs> I apologize for this slide. There's going to be some. There's going to be a lot of notation, um, but I'll try. You know, I'll try to explain what everything is, and then at the end I will maybe state the essential point of um, what's going on. So this extension that I said we had to consider, uh, this Galois group is isomorphic to the units in the p-adic integers, which decomposes as some torsion subgroup times zp. Um, and for technical reasons, just to make a, a statement that is true, uh, and the simplest sort of statement that I can make really. I have to replace this uh, this extension, which is a ZP cross extension, with a ZP plus extension. So, in other words, I take um, I take this Galois group and then I quotient by the order two um, subgroup given by complex conjugation, and I get some smaller subfield. And I want to really focus on that. Okay, so there's some there's some funny issue going on with even and odd Dirichlet characters, but um, let me just ignore this for now. Okay, so since this is a p-adic story, what you what it turns out that ends up being the right thing to look at is what's called a p-adic zeta function. So this is something called zeta p, which is in the fraction field of basically the completed group algebra over this Galois group. Okay, so uh, abstractly this has, um, sorry, one second. Right, so I mean, this has this, yeah, so this is a completed group algebra over um, over this group, and then abstractly, the structure is isomorphic to a power series ring over a, a finite group algebra over ZP. So it's some sort of finite collection of power series. And the, in some precise sense, this interpolates the negative odd integer values of the Riemann zeta function. Okay, so this is like, I mean, this is some p-adic interpolation of a certain part of the Riemann zeta function. But I mean, of course, since the complex and p-adic topologies are totally different, you have to interpolate just at some discrete set of points in the complex plane. And the negative odd integer values are those special values. OK, so a quick technical remark. Um, you can classify finitely generated torsion modules over this, over this group algebra, which again is just um, a power series ring over a finite group algebra, in terms of what are called their characteristic ideals, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, and these are generated by elements um, in, this, in this ring, in this completed group algebra. So the theorem, oh, so what the thought um, made? Um, the, this group, this group algebra is not a domain, right? It's not a domain, no. no, no so no. when you write frac, you, that means like a product of of um, fields. Or oh yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. Sorry, I mean the total yeah. ring of fractions. Yeah. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um. Yes. So right. So the theorem, what the USL main conjecture for Q in this case says, is that the characteristic ideal of the finitely generated torsion module. Over this, okay, so this completed group algebra is just ZP, ZP plus, right? I'm just rewriting. Uh, oh, sorry. My computer is doing all kinds of funny things. Um, sorry. Yeah, so the characteristic ideal of the finitely generated torsion module over the C Wasawa algebra, this group algebra, X infinity. So X infinity is the Gawa group of the maximal abelian extension of Q infinity, this, uh, this subfield of p power degree um, unramified away from the unique prime line over p. So I mean, somehow you can think of this. This isn't precisely the Tate module of um, of this, like, uh, this isn't precisely this inverse limit of class groups. But this is sort of, I mean, to make the statement precise, you need this slight modification. But this should be equal to basically the p-adic zeta function. I mean, OK, there's some, uh, there's some technicality where the, the zeta function is a pole. And somehow you have to multiply by this augmentation ideal in this uh, in this group algebra to get um, the correct thing that compares with uh, the characteristic ideal of this uh, this torsion thing. But so, I mean, OK, uh, there's a lot of notation. <laughs> I apologize for how technical this got. Uh, it's going to be less technical for the rest of the talk. But the key takeaway is really that um, the characteristic ideal. So I mean, OK, I have, a, I have a module which I'm calling x infinity, which is a module for a group algebra over zp. So you can think of this, and it ends up being really a finite free ZP module with an action of the Galois group. And when I say the characteristic ideal, really somehow what I mean is you're keeping track of the characteristic polynomial of generators of, of the group. OK, so you, right. So I mean, somehow like this uh, notion of characteristic ideal is one algebraic way to say eigen, is to sort of keep track of the eigenvalues of, of um, Galois elements acting on some, some module. And the point is that those eigenvalues are exactly equal to the characteristic ideal generated by 
uh, zeta p, which is exactly corresponding to the zeros of this function zeta p. So somehow this is some bizarre kind of complicated way of encoding eigenvalues and uh, zeros of a, of a zeta function and claiming that they're equal to each other. Okay, so I bought, yeah, again, uh, Iwasawa theory, I, I find it, I still haven't cracked, you know, giving like a good sort of non-technical exposition of the basic statement for GL1, but this is this is my attempt. <laughs> um, but so anyway, so this is sort of what's going on uh, for this simple case of spec Z in, in GL1, but the goal of this talk is to explain how this picture, first of all, generalizes the modular forms, which is uh, work of many people. And then what I want to talk about is work that I'm trying to do to generalize this picture to families of modular forms over the Eigen curve. Okay, so the Eigen curve is some rigid analytic space whose points correspond to p-adic modular forms. So in particular, classical modular forms are contained in the Eigen curve, and then there are more complicated objects showing up. Okay. So let me, yeah, so first of all, let me say, um, let me say how you how you might phrase things if you switch uh, from, you know, going from a point to a modular form. So for this, uh, let I'm going to fix a level subgroup uh, gamma, which is gamma one n intersected with gamma zero p, usual congruent subgroups in SL two z, um, and I fix a normalized cuspidal eigenform uh, of weight k and level gamma, where k is greater than or equal to two, and some Nebbis type is character epsilon. Okay. So a theorem of many people says that there exists a unique semi-simple continuous rep Galois representation associated with this modular form. And this goes from the uh, Galois group of the maximal extension of Q unramified outside of N and P, so the sort of bad places in the prime P. Um, and it's a p-adic Galois representation such that the traces of Frobenius uh, give you the, L the Fourier coefficients of the modular form. And the determinants of Frobenius can be computed in terms of uh, the Nevin type as character and the power of L. OK, so associated to modular forms, you have Galois representations, which recover a lot of the arithmetic data. So to formulate the Iwasawa main conjecture in the way that I want to think about it, um, I'm going to think about not this group algebra itself, but the rigid analytic space that it gives rise to. OK, so this, I mean, this completed group ring has an associated formal scheme. And to a formal scheme, you can take an associated rigid space. And um, if you're not familiar with these things, what you can think of, like this particular rigid space, you can think of as just being um, the union of a bunch of p-adic uh, open unit disks. Okay, and the point is that somehow the, right, I, I mean, this is a power series ring over a, a group ring over a finite group. And each element of the finite group corresponds, or each character of the finite group, if you like, corresponds to one of these um, disks. And the fact that you're having, you know, power series ring corresponds to the fact that you have, you know, power series which converge on a disk. Okay, I'll draw a picture of this later. So in order to go from something like spec Z to a modular form, there's a couple of replacements you need to make. So first of all, you had a zeta function, right? Which was a zeta function that lived in this group algebra and you think of as a p-adic analytic function. And this gets replaced by what's called the p-adic L function of the modular form. And this is something that is uh, a global section of this rigid space, or in other words, a, an analytic function on these this union of p-adic disks. Okay, and I, the, the thing I wanna emphasize is that these functions in this group algebra, they, they give you functions on these rigid analytic open unit disks, but there are a lot more functions on the unit disk because on the unit disk, you're allowed to have um, denominators. Um, you're allowed to have like P in the denominator of the coefficients of the power series, which is not allowed in, the, in this simpler group ring. And in general, this will happen for these, uh, these uh, L functions. Okay, so X infinity, which was this, um, somehow this replacement for the piatic tape module, this gets generalized into what's known as a Selmer group. And in the geometric way that I'm interpreting this, this should be somehow a torsion module over this um, over this group ring. But in the way that it, like in order to phrase things properly to generalize to the Eigen curve, you think of this as a torsion coherent sheaf on this, uh, on this uh, union of disks. Okay. Now characteristic ideals, um, I think the most geo, a convenient geometric way to think about them in general is as effective divisors, right? I mean, really, when I take a characteristic ideal, I'm just trying to count the number of zeros in a zeta function. And for this, I mean, a, a nice way of thinking about this is, you know, D is a, a one-dimensional space, and effective divisors are just sort of locally finite formal sums of points on that disk. So I can keep track of the zeros of an L function with a divisor, like a V divisor, let's say. So then the conjecture stated in this way says that the divisor associated with a torsion coherent sheaf 
is equal to the, the divisor of the piatic L function. Okay, so what is the divisor of a, a torsion coherent sheaf? Well, again, I mean, I, I'll say something more about how you define this precisely, but the point is that, again, this, this torsion coherent sheaf, you should somehow think of it as a, you know, as a, a module for this group algebra. So it's like a finite free ZP algebra, uh, sorry, ZP module with um, an action of a Gawa group. And again, this is somehow, you know, encoding the eigenvalues of the actions of Gawa elements on this module. Okay, uh, I have a question. So for the thermal group, uh, you just define the, like uh, uh, the uh, global cohomology to the local cohomology to the kernel uh, of the theta, theta module of uh, sorry the the Gaussian representations at the before, yes. right? Yes, that's how you, okay. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say more about this in the next few slides. Okay. I'm be more precise. Yeah, but thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm gonna in the next few slides I'm gonna def like say what this thing is. I'm going to say how you define the Selmer group, and then I'm going to talk a bit about this notion of effective divisor and how you get one from um, from the Selmer group and the piatic L function. OK. So first of all, let me give a brief overview of how you define a piatic L function of a cusp form. So if, yeah, so start with a cusp form f. Uh, wait, look, OK, I changed to k plus 2 for some normalization reasons, but just think of this as weight k. Um, pick a Dirichlet character of conductor d some positive integer, then you can define an L function. And if you like, you can twist it by a Dirichlet character um, by just taking this power series, which is defined in terms of the Fourier coefficients of the modular form. OK. And uh, a basic fact is that this converges for a uh, real part uh, large enough, and it actually analytically continues to an entire function on the complex plane. And you can see this by showing that it's, OK, when I this tilde notation, I'm saying that this is equal up to a constant that depends only on s, a non-zero constant that depends only on s. And so this L function can be computed as an integral in the upper half plane um, of the function f of z, so the modular form, and then some uh, z to some, you know, the power given by this, uh, this s that you want to evaluate your L function. And um, yeah, so I mean, you can compute this L function in some you know, with respect to some integral which matches the uh, the power series that you gave, and then this integral lets you analytically continue the function to the complex plane. Okay, and the same thing is true with the the twisted L function. I mean, the the, the, con the constant that shows up is a bit more complicated. The integral has to be taken. You know, it's a slightly different integral in the upper half plane, but I mean, uh, but the the principle is the same. This L function is computed as an integral, and you use this to continue the function. Okay, so what's a piatic L function? So um, just to state things correctly, I, I just want to make one note, which is that you can interpret this rigid space that I defined a couple slides ago as the moduli space of continuous characters from ZP cross to R cross, where R is a QP algebra. OK, so this is the sort of moduli space of p-adic characters of ZP cross. And the reason I say this is because when you, so the, yeah, the statement that I want to make is that if F is a modular form, uh, and you assume it's a new form, of level gamma with with up eigenvalue so there's some heck operator up acting on this space of modular forms um, alpha and i assume that the piatic valuation of alpha is less than k plus one so this is in the literature um, known as f having non-critical slope then you can then yeah the theorem says that there exists a piatic l function so this is some global section of this disk as i said before such that if you have a dirichlet character of conductor p to the n and if j is in this kind of non-critical range of, um, of values then if I evaluate this piatic L function at this character, right? So remember I said that D is the moduli space of continuous characters of uh, ZP cross. So I'm evaluating it th at this specific character. So um, yeah, so I have sort of this J here and then the chi that I picked in the sentence above. This is equal, again, up to some complicated constant that depends on alpha, depends on chi, and depends on J, but is very easy to write down. This is equal to the, uh, the value of the L function at J plus one divided by some sort of normalization factor, which depends only on the modular form f and the integer j. Okay. Uh, is the Lin's period, what are these omega plus minus? Shimura's period? Yes, they're Shimura's periods. I mean, they're periods that depend only on the modular form. OK. OK. And um, right, so how do you do this? I mean, one way of doing this, to defining this piatic L function, is to sort of algebraize the notion of a period integral and then try to periodically interpolate um, this algebraic formalism. So I'm not going to go into the details, but basically you do this use, well, I mean, one way to do this um, 
which is a particular interest for me, is to use the theory of modular symbols, um, which are another way of saying compactly supported singular cohomology classes. Um, but the formalism of modular symbols gives you an easy way to kind of um, turn these integrals into kind of like an algebraic, uh, the data of these integrals into an algebraic object. And they allow you to, to, to define LPF fairly directly. OK. So now we have, so right, I mean, now we have the, the kind of analog for modular forms of the, of the piadic zeta function, which we'll use um, in the statement of the Ivasal main conjecture. OK, so now let me, let me say a brief word about these Selmer groups and how you define them. Okay, so recall row F uh, is the attached Galois representation. Um, right, so to define this, first note that D, this rigid space, um, which is the moduli space of characters of ZP cross, acquires a Galois action via the cyclotomic character. Okay, so D is, uh, you know, um, D is the completed, is this, the rigid generic fiber of basically the completed group algebra of this group. And so somehow the ZP cross acts naturally on the space and you get a Galois action. And we define something which is called the cyclotomic deformation of this Galois representation. Okay, so the cyclotomic deformation is you basically you take this finite dimensional, you know, QP, let's say QP vector space or maybe some finite extension, and then you tensor with OD, which is the, the structure sheaf of this um, this rigid space, and you equip this with the diagonal action of GQNP. So GQNP via the cyclotomic character acts on OD, and it acts via rho F on V. And so you can somehow just put these together. Uh, and for technical reasons, you have to invert the cyclotomic character, but this is, this is just how the theory works out. Um, yeah, so this is called the cyclotomic deformation. And right, so what's the definition of the Selmer group then? The Selmer group is, as Tong was saying earlier, it's a it's a subspace of the second Galois cohomology of GQNP acting on this cyclotomic deformation. And you impose local conditions. Um, at the finite places. And in particular, you impose an unramified condition at the places dividing the bad primes. And you can in impose what's called a triangulant condition at the prime P. Okay. Now, sorry, it, so if anyone is if anyone has seen the Iwasawa theory before and seen um, the definition of a Selmer group, you might have seen it as like a, an Iwa, a, what's called an Iwasawa cohomology group, which is somehow where instead of looking at this kind of weird thing that I've defined you, you take an inverse limit of Galois groups of finite extensions. But these two perspectives are equivalent. I mean, this is just sort of another reworking of, of that theory. So yeah, if the term if the terminology looks unfamiliar, it's the same thing happening. Um, kind of the data, like, the, yeah, the, the fact that you're taking an inverse limit up the tower is encoded somehow in the fact that you cyclotomically deformed by this uh, Galois group of the tower. OK, so let me say something about this. So what does this triangulant condition mean? So when f is up ordinary, in other words, if the valuation of, uh, of the of the eigenvalue alpha of up is, is zero, then this Galois representation is, turns out to be reducible after restricting to p. And so it has a, a sort of distinguished one dimensional subspace. And the local condition at p is defined using this subspace. So you basically look at classes which land in this, uh, the cohomology of this subspace instead of the whole thing. If not, um, <clears throat> if you have, yeah, if you have a non ordinary modular form, then this thing can be irreducible, this uh, row fp. But even if it's irreducible, you can show that if you take its um, associated phi gamma module. So a phi gamma module is some sort of linear algebraic way of interpreting Gal p adic Galois representations. Um, these things will, will actually be reducible as phi gamma modules, but not as Galois representations. But in particular, there is some notion of a triangulant subs. Uh, you know, there is some uh, canonical one-dimensional subspace, and you can use this subspace to uh, define a local condition, noting that there's a cohomology of phi gamma modules, which is um, completely, which is yeah, fully related to the cohomology of uh, uh, the Galois representation. That's a Galois module. Okay, so it turns out that yeah, I mean, somehow in the ordinary case it's clear what to do, and then in the non-ordinary case you have to do a bit of piadic Hodge theory, and then you can you can find some suitable replacement that does the trick. Okay, so let me just say something about divisors. Um, so yeah, this I, I mean. I'm, yeah, I mean, somehow this definition is, I say, due to Podharst in the sense that I think Podharst's exposition of this is the first time that this was the perspective taken in Iwasawa theory um, in the rigid context. Uh, so this definition says that, yeah, if you take a torsion coherent OD module, then its divisor is defined to be the sum over all the closed points of this rigid space of um, the length of the module localized at the point. Okay, so in other words, 
yeah, you're, you're, you're somehow, I mean, you have some torsion module and it's sort of supported on a bunch of closed, you know, it's supported on these height one prime ideals and, and you know, affinoid locally. And you're taking the length as the multiplicity. Uh, and then, yeah, you have a bunch of uh, formal sums um, indexed by these closed points P. Okay, so I, I want to emphasize that D is not an affinoid rigid space. It's not like, you know, it's not some quasi compact thing. And so in particular, this sum is not going to be literally finite. But it'll be finite if you restrict the sum to any aff affinoid uh, subspace of the rigid space. And this reflects the fact that piadic L functions really, outside of the ordinary case, have infinitely many zeros. And so if you want to keep track of the zeros of a piadic L function, you need, you know, you really need beta visors in this uh, to, to be these infinite formal sums. Okay. So that's a divisor for the torsion coherent OD module, which is going to be the Selmer, uh, the Selmer group. And then if G is um, a global section of the rigid space D, which you should think of as the piadic L function. And if I denote MGP, the multiplicity of the zero of G at the point P, if, you know, so it could be zero if it has no zero, like the multiplicity could be equal to zero if there's no zero of the function at P, but otherwise it's some number. Um, then the divisor is just given by, yeah, it's just given by the multiplicities um, summed over all the closed points as usual. And again, this can be an infinite sum uh, for a general rigid analytic function, but locally finite. Right, so that, so, okay, so now I can restate the conjecture I stated earlier, having introduced all the definitions. So the conjecture first says that this uh, H2 Selmer is a torsion coherent OD module. So, I mean, this thing has to be torsion in order to even state the conjecture. And then once you know that this is torsion, you can define this divisor as I just did. And um, this conjecture says that this should be equal to the divisor of the analytic P L function. Okay, so this is probably, I mean, if you've seen the USL main conjecture before, this probably isn't the way you've seen it. I mean, uh, there's tons of different ways to like write the actual statement down. People usually use characteristic ideals, but I think for the, like, in order to do what I want to do for the rest of the talk, it's helpful to have this perspective, um, which is somehow a slightly more explicitly geometric way of stating the thing. Um, yeah, so I just want to say that this is known in many cases when F is UP ordinary. Um, by work of Kato in one direction and Skinner or Bond uh, in more recent work, maybe like, I don't know, eight or nine years ago um, for the converse direction. And there's there are other variants of this statement. I mean, this isn't the only USL main conjecture that exists, so like a Gawa theoretic variant. So, I mean, somehow you can you can make a different statement where this piadic L function is replaced by something purely defined in terms of the Gawa representation uh, with, um, and other related statements are known in many cases when f is non-ordinary by Shin Wan. So there is there are results in the in the non-ordinary case, but they somehow don't explicitly use the uh, they don't, well, they're not stated in terms of this piadic L function as such. Okay, right. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about what I'm trying to do, um, building on the work of people that I'll mention, uh, which is to take this this uh, this conjecture and just sort of at least be, you know at least state it for families of modular forms. And um, say like how you can kind of interpolate this conjecture into, into piadic families. Okay, so for this, I'm going to introduce um, in a sketchy way by drawing pictures the Eigen curve. So what is the Eigen curve? The Eigen curve is the space of finite slope over convergent modular forms, um, or more precisely, their Hecke Eigen systems. So this is some generalization of the notion of a modular form where, oh sorry, instead of having um, Piatico, sorry, instead of having uh, complex coefficients, you have piatic coefficients, and you can somehow vary these things nicely in a family. And really, like somehow, when you define the eigencurve, what you really do is you look at a Hecke algebra acting on a space of such things, and then you, uh, you know, piatically interpolate that thing. Um, right. So to construct the eigencurve, first of all, you vary the weight piatically, right? So in the theory of modular forms, you have a weight um, which determines the, you know, the, con the automorphy condition on the modular form. And in the piadic theory, these are replaced by maps, so characters um, from ZP cross to CP cross, uh, which take x to x to the k. So yeah, k corresponds to the specific character. And as I said before, D, the space D that I was talking about earlier, is the moduli space of continuous characters of ZP cross. So somehow these these WKs um, should really live in this this uh, in this rigid space D. Um, so from my perspective, what I'm really trying to do is work with something slightly more general, which is called uh, a pseudo, which is, gonna, which is called the extended eigencurve, and um, takes place in the world of pseudo-affinoid rings. OK, 
Okay, so pseudo-affinoid rings are somehow, um, you should think of them as affinoid rings. So like the usual kind of Tate algebras that show up in theatic uh, geometry and in like rigid analytic geometry. But I'm allowing myself now to have attic spaces, which are uh, slightly more general in that these rigid spaces have these characteristic P points attached to their boundaries. Okay, so let me say what I mean by this. So W is going to be the space of weights, which looks a lot like D, except that um, instead of taking the rigid generic fiber of the formal scheme of this thing, I take the attic spectrum. Which, so it's, this is somehow the, the space of continuous valuations on this uh, on this ring, and I take the analytic points inside of that. Okay, so if you're not familiar with attic spaces or not used to this terminology, let me draw a picture of what this looks like. Okay, here's a picture. Um, so like I said, I mean, this is a power series ring uh, over a finite group algebra. And so, you, you know, this should, this should correspond to, you know, functions converging on a bunch of different disks. So there's P minus one disks corresponding to the characters of Z mod P cross. Um, and each of these disks is, I mean, it really is a piatic open unit disk, right? Like it has all of the, yeah, I mean, it's the usual piatic open unit disk you see in rigid geometry, which is the units of, of CP cross. But now there's this funny characteristic P boundary point. Uh, which which lives sort of at the boundary and is sort of close to all of the points with piatic valuation close to the boundary of the piatic open unit disk. And whereas in normal rigid spaces, um, the residue fields are like over QP, the residue fields are defined are finite extensions of QP. When you allow yourself to take these mixed characteristic, um, you know, attic spaces, you get boundary points which are now defined over function fields in characteristic P. Okay, so. I mean, really, if you want to think about this in terms of valuations, what's happening is that I'm taking um, I'm taking this ring, I'm quotienting by I'm you know I'm modding out by p, and I'm maybe modding out by let's say a character of z mod p cross, and then I'm taking the t attic valuation uh, with respect to this power series variable t. So it's kind of this funny thing where now like the roles of p and t in this in this you know completed group algebra are kind of swapping roles, where p is what happens with the generic fiber. You know, over QP, and then T happens somehow at the boundary. Okay, so I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is, I mean, this is kind of the space of weights that uh, that this eigencurve is naturally going to live over. Okay, so here's a very, very, very impressionistic picture of what the eigencurve looks like. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely not to be taken too literally. Uh, but let me try to explain what's going on. So at the bottom, I'm redrawing my weight space just as a line. So before I drew it as disks, but it's, I mean, okay, it's a one dimensional thing. I'm just drawing it as a line. Uh, it has this boundary thing, which okay, really these are the same point, but I'm just drawing them on both sides uh, because I drew it as a line. And the Eigen curve is, yeah, so it's one of these attic spaces. It's one of these, you know, these pseudo rigid spaces. So it's like a rigid space plus some characteristic P locus. And what does it look like? Well, it's a one-dimensional thing. It's a curve, which is why it's called an eigen curve. Um, and right, what is it? Well, it's it's the space of overconvergent piatic modular forms. So it's the space of Hecke eigen systems in in these sort of large spaces of piatic modular forms. And the the reason I draw the picture like the, the way I do is there's something called the spectral halo conjecture, which actually predicts what the structure of this curve looks like towards the boundary of these piatic disks. Okay, so towards the boundary. The conjecture, which is proven now, uh, proven I think about a year ago, says that if you if you just cut out the middle of the the if you cut out the piece of the eigen curve living over the middle of this disk and just look at the edges, then you get um, really you get a, a, a an infinite union of of sort of things that look like white space, uh, which somehow um, yeah which somehow live in an arithmetic regression that has something to do with the slopes of the modular forms so the eigen curve has some very predictable structure at the at, near the boundary of weight space but then in the middle of weight space i mean it's some you know it's something which uh can be extremely complicated i mean it, it, like a lot of basic things aren't known like so for instance this like it's not known whether this uh whether this curve is connected you know like it's not it's not clear whether these disconnected components at the boundary actually touch each other in the middle or don't touch each other in the middle um there's specific, I mean, there, there are sort of theorems proved about the geometry of the Eigen curve in the in small neighborhoods of points, but but somehow, yeah, I mean, in general, not much is known. But I mean, in this picture, right, so I have the simple part of the edge, I have the potentially more complicated thing in the middle. Um, I have a boundary weight and I have these boundary points, which are somehow modular forms living in characters, the P over this boundary weight and weight space. But then if I have a, a, a weight, like, you know, you can think of this as just the weight K for weight K modular forms. Then I have a bunch of things living over this, 
And this discrete set of points is, uh, is the space of eigenforms of weight w. OK, and one, maybe one important thing to point out is that even if the weight that you pick is like the weight k of a modular form, it may happen, I mean, it does happen that there are things that live on this curve which are not classical modular forms. So a lot of like, a, you know, one easy source of points on this on this curve is to just take a, a classical weight and then just consider modular forms, which give rise to systems of Hecke eigenvalues, which then give you points on this curve. But then there are other things that appear. Um, and this has to do with the way that you define these bigger spaces of modular forms. OK. Right. Um, yeah, so this is OK. So this is an attic space. It has a map to weight space, which just given a, you know, given a sort of p-adic modular form, it tells you what the weight is. And yeah, so this, this thing in characteristic 0 was originally defined by Coleman and Mazur uh, in 1998 from a paper from 1998. Um, and this was extended fairly recently to characteristic p in order, to, basically in order to think about the spectral halo conjecture um, by Andreazza, Iovita, and Piloni. And the version that I'm using is the work of uh, Christian Johansson and James Newton, um, where they sort of, I mean, yeah, somehow Andreazza, Iovita, and Piloni, uh, they use coherent cohomology to define these things. And, and my advisor and Christian Johansson use uh, Sort of singular cohomology instead with big coefficient systems. So I'm, I'm using this perspective, uh, and independently was introduced by uh, Dan Gulota in, in 2019. Um, so maybe yeah, I mean maybe one thing if 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 this notion of a t-adic modular form seems a bit strange, um, one way to think about them is that they have uh, perfectoid properties in some precise sense. So what I mean by this is that a p-adic modular form, which lives in the characteristic zero locus of the Eigen curve is uh, you can think of it in terms of a Q expansion. Right? So you can think of it in terms of a Q expansion where the coefficients are now sort of p-adic numbers instead of complex numbers. And if you choose a sequence of such p-adic forms uh, in such a way that as, as, as in such a way that they, they sort of approach the boundary of the Eigen curve and the coefficient satisfies some sort of Frobenius compatibility. So some sort of like the kind of thing that you see when you define like the tilt uh, of a perfectoid field. So, um, you know, if, basically, if you take a bunch of modular forms and then you mod out by p, and then you get that the that these things are Frobenius compatible, then you can show that they actually converge to something in the limit on the boundary, which is a t-adic modular form. Right. So somehow, I mean, this characteristic zero locus lives over qp. The characteristic p locus lives over fpt. But if you base change everything to a perfectoid field, then suddenly you can actually literally tilt modular forms into characteristic p. OK, so this is maybe like one, yeah, one perspective that tells you like how these things arise. And this is, yeah, sorry, this is due to work of Ben Hoyer, um, who's a student in, in London uh, who worked on this for his thesis. OK, so now I can talk about the theorem that uh, the main theorem I'm, I'm interested in, in presenting. So as we did earlier, so I have this weight space, which is um, which is given by the modular space of characters, but also I'm going to take d, the d that I was using before, to now be this the sort of attic space reinterpretation of the group algebra over the Galois group of q mu p infinity. Okay, so I take the attic spectrum of this thing, and then I take the analytic locus. So then, following ideas of Belaish and David Hansen, we prove the following theorem. So the statement is that if you take the Eigen curve, which I denote by E n, and then okay, there, you, you have to restrict to the locus of new forms, which is some union of irreducible components, and then you have to normalize just for technical reasons. But if you take this, you know, some piece of the Eigen curve, and you take the product with d, which is the space that's supposed to be sort of like the variable of the p-adic L function, then there exists a non-trivial line bundle over the space and a global section of this line bundle. Sorry, this is supposed to be the yeah, it's supposed to be the global sections of this line bundle, which specialize um, which specializes to the usual p-adic L function at every classical point of, uh, of the new part of this Eigen curve up to a unit, up to a p-adic unit. OK, so the statement is somehow that, um, you know, right? I mean, locally at a point, you have a p-adic L function for a classical modular form. And the statement is that uh, you can define, you can, you can vary this p-adic L function in families. But if you want to do this correctly, you can't just, um, you can't just take a global section of the entire space, uh, you know, the Eigen curve across this rigid space. Instead, you have to, um, you have to really take a non-trivial line bundle. And the reason is basically that if you take the global sections of D, the global sections of D are just going to be this group algebra, right? I mean, the functions that converge sort of on, on this attic space are really just going to be only these like bounded 
denominator things. But in general, my, the periodic L functions that I care about are really, they have infinitely many zeros. And so their denominators are unbounded and satisfy the convergence condition. And so in order to state this precisely, I need to, I need to somehow allow there a, a twist in my line bundle to make it so that the coefficients can kind of vary across the Eigen curve. Um, and yeah, and I, I mean, maybe like one, one thing to say is that the non-triviality of this line bundle, it allows for ambiguity up to the unit. So really what I'm saying is that the piatic L function is really only somehow globally in families defined up to a unit. And when you trivialize the line bundle, that basically amounts to like picking the unit that you're scaling your piatic L function by in some sense. Okay, so it's like choosing an isomorphism between L restricted to some affinoid space with the structure sheath of the, the affinoid space. Okay, so what's the proof? Well, I mean, what I said before in a very sketchy way was that to define the piatic L function for a modular form, uh, you, right, I mean, you, you, you somehow note that to define, yeah, sorry, you note that the L function can be computed in terms of period integrals. And so then you sort of algebraize this notion of period integral into something called a modular symbol. And then you, you know, you put piatic coefficients into the theory of modular symbols. And this is essentially the same thing that happens, except you have to do this basically in families over the whole Eigen curve. So there's a, I mean, there's some work to do to, you know, uh, to sort of set up the theory of modular symbols in this context and um, set up the coefficients so that everything works precisely and, and in such a way that you can define this global section canonically. Okay. But I mean, okay, so some interesting things, like the, the, basically the thing about this that I'm, I'm still a bit like mystified by and that I'm, I'm trying to kind of understand better is, right, a piatic L function is something that you, you initially define because you care about modular forms, right? You care about actual modular forms. Um, and you care about the USL main conjecture for a classical object. But if you take an F, uh, if you take a point with like, you know, on the boundary of the Eigen curve, right? So if you take one of, um, let's, say, let's say these purple points, which exist on the sort of the edges of, uh, of these components, then, yeah, I mean, it's not really, you know, you, you get some, some thing, which is like a P attic L function. I mean, maybe it should be called a T attic L function because somehow you, this P attic L function is a, it's a, a, a rigid analytic function on a rigid space in characteristic P, but I mean, yeah, I mean, somehow it's not, in, it's not entirely clear what the arithmetic significance of this is, um, which is something that I'm thinking about um, actively now. And I, I, you know, I have some, I have some ideas about how it should maybe, um, tell you something about the behavior of piatic L functions near the boundary, but I haven't been able to say anything precise yet. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, in theory, this like having information about the boundary itself in characteristic P should hopefully tell you something about points near the boundary in characteristic zero. Okay, so this is, so right. So I, I wanna state a new SL main conjecture. And so I have a, you know, I have a piatic L function. And so now I need some piatic variation of the Selmer groups. Okay, so to define this, I just adapt the previous formalism to this setting. Okay, so let me say what I mean. So over, um, yeah, over this this piece of the Eigen curve that I care about, you can show that there's a canonical sheaf of two dimensional. Or this is, you know, a, yeah, it's a, a free rank two sheaf of uh, of Galois representations, so GQ and P representations, what I call V. And again, as I did before, I can cyclotomically deform it. Right, so I have a Galois action on this uh, this attic space D, just like I had in the rigid space. And then I can have the same kind of action. So it acts by the Galois representation on the Eigen curve, and then it acts via the inverse of the cyclotomic character on D. Okay, so then you can define the Selmer group basically in the same way. So the Selmer group is, I put an unramified condition on the Galois representation, uh, which is now like a sheaf sort of, yeah, I mean, right? I mean, you have a sheaf of, um, of, uh, of Galois cohomology classes. And yeah, somehow I'm saying that you take the an unramified condition uh, at the prime, at the primes uh, dividing n, and then at the prime dividing p, you use a local condition which is defined by a triangulation, right? So in other words, a rank one subsheaf of the associated phi gamma module, or in this case, family of phi gamma modules. Um, and this notion of family of phi gamma modules was until very recently not uh, developed in this sort of mixed characteristic setting. I mean, like, you know, because I, I work with rigid spaces, but then really I work with these like pseudo rigid spaces where I have this FPT points. Uh, and this is, this triangulation for these Galois representations over over this like en new thing is constructed in forthcoming work of Rebecca Belden. So this is something that's been recently developed to the point where you can make a conjecture like this and define a Selmer group in this way. Um, yeah, and so I mean, then you can define characteristic ideal sheaves of torsion coherent sheaves over this this thing, which is now a two dimensional uh, pseudo rigid space. 
so two-dimensional kind of periodic analytic space um, by basically defining the notion of a characteristic ideal sheave or really, really a divisor um, affinoid locally. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I was editing these slides and I meant to change characteristic ideal sheaves to divisors everywhere. So you can define divisors of torsion coherent sheaves over these two-dimensional spaces as well. And so here's a kind of, I mean, here's a kind of conjectural picture uh, of what I think it should somehow look like. So the eigencurve is this one-dimensional thing. And again, for simplicity, I'm just going to draw it as a line with a bound, and you know, you know, it's something which has boundary points. Um, but the so so there's the two variable periodic L function I defined. The if you look at the zero locus of this thing, somehow this should be this should correspond to basically one-dimensional subspaces of the fiber product of this eigencurve with D, which is this sort of cyclotomic variable that you get from this uh, group algebra over the Galois group. And the point really is that like um, the vanishing locus of the two variable p-adic L function should be a bunch of a bunch of lines in this thing. And then when you intersect with a classical point on the Eigen curve, this intersection, like the it, it should intersect exactly at the zeros of the classical p-adic L functions. Okay. So the, the reason I say this is, a, and, and yeah, I mean, a similar thing should happen at boundary points. The reason I say that this is a conjectural picture is because a priori, I don't know that for instance, I don't know that the piatic L function can't just vanish identically along the fiber of one of these classical points. Right? So I don't know that the piatic L function will just not be identically zero at like a non-classical piatic modular form. Um, but I mean, this is, yeah, this is like, if you want to think of what this piatic L function sort of looks like in terms of its zeros, this is conjecturally what, um, what should be going on. Okay. And similarly, uh, yeah, similarly, you, you know, I define this this Selmer group in the same way, which now lives in, in a family over the Eigen curve. And this should, you know, you can associate to it a divisor, and the divisors, um, the prime divisor showing up in the divisor that you associate should exactly be these curves on which the piatic L function vanishes, which is basically the content of the USL main conjecture in this context. Okay. So finally, I can state <clears throat> the two variable main conjecture, which is very much still a conjecture and something that I'd like to try to work on more in the future. So recall, <clears throat> recall that the piatic L function, which I called L, the two variable one, is a global section of a line bundle. OK, so to a section of a line bundle on normal rigid space, you can associate to a divisor by locally trivializing. Right? So I mean, sort of on an affinoid piece, the line bundle trivializes. You get a global section. You can define a divisor. And then this, I mean, this glues together over the whole space. Um, you know, this all, I mean, this is the same thing that happens in the theory of schemes or, or rigid spaces. Uh, yeah, OK, so then the conjecture says that, first of all, this thing, which is, the, uh, which is a sheaf uh, over e times d, this is a torsion coherent module for the structure sheaf. And, uh, and the divisor that you then associate to it should be equal to the divisor of the piatic L function. OK, so this is the conjecture. I don't know how to prove this conjecture yet, but um, yeah, I mean, so far what I've been on this project so far, I've, I've just been trying to like write down all of the sort of prerequisites you need to like, you know, do all this rigorously and state this conjecture precisely. Um, but I mean, I guess maybe, yeah, maybe one feature that you'd expect to have is that this conjecture implies the USL main conjecture at classical points, right? I mean, the point is that you basically just take the divisors on both sides and restrict them to, um, restrict them to uh, the fiber over a point on the Eigen curve. And then you, sh you you know you should be able to recover the the classical statement, which is that the um, h two, the sort of support of this h two, in codimension one is equal to the vanishing locus of the piatic L function. Okay, so yeah, and so in future work, what do I want to do? I want to try to, um, I want to try to prove one inclusion, um, basically following Kato's strategy. Uh, so Kato's strategy. Um, which he used to prove uh, one inclusion in the main conjecture for ordinary forms was to use the existence of an Euler system uh, for the modular form F, for a single modular form. And David Hansen in, in an old paper um, shows that there's a two variable Euler system over the, over the, uh, the Eigen curve, but I mean, you can extend this to the extended Eigen curve in characteristic P. Um, and I want to try to, yeah, I mean, one thing that I haven't done carefully yet, but that I'd like to do is to try to see if this strategy can give you a result like the USL main conjecture in families, or at least something maybe, uh, well, sorry, one direction of it, or maybe something slightly weaker on maybe a smaller subspace, depending on how restrictive um, the proof ends up being. And then, yeah, as I said before, I mean, you can, you have a, a piatic L function living in characteristic P now. Uh, you can specialize this conjecture over a characteristic P point, 
and you get a main conjecture and characteristic p and i still you know as i say i don't fully understand the arithmetic content of this but at least for HEDA families um this should be related to what's called the mod pl function of a HEDA family which was something considered by emerson pollock and weston um in a paper that they have about HEDA theory where they study sort of iwasawa invariants and how they vary in in HEDA families which are which are pieces of the right i mean a HEDA family is sort of an ordinary a family of ordinary modular forms living in the eigencurve so at least on the locus that they consider, I think that there should be some way to relate this this characteristic p main conjecture to the mod pl function um, that they consider there. Uh, yes, so this is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Yeah. <clears throat> any questions? Yes. Can I? You, at the very beginning, you mentioned the uh, Langlands de Lin, the local correspondence. Uh -huh. Where did you use this? Did you use this anywhere in the in your argument? Um, sorry, do you mean the existence of Galois representations? Yes, at the very beginning. Um, ah, this thing. Creole, yeah, I yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. So, I guess what I'm really doing is. Um, yeah, I mean the the way that so I mean somehow you have to. Uh, sorry, let me go back to the end. Uh, right, so it, it somehow encoded, I mean, that a similar thing is somehow encoded in this statement. So what I'm saying is that there exists a canonical sheaf of two-dimensional Galois representations. Um, but somehow to do this, you need to, uh, I mean, you need to construct this Galois representations in families in some convenient way for the theory. And for this, I, you have to do a complicated thing where you construct the Galois representation over local pieces of the Eigen curve using a tal cohomology and a comparison between singular and a tal cohomology. Um, so somehow what I'm doing is, um, you know, the way the Eigen curve is constructed is using modular symbols. And modular symbols are sort of compactly supported cohomology classes on the modular curve. And I'm using a singular to a tal comparison over formal schemes that model pieces of the Eigen curve to sort of take this Galois representation and just port it over to the Eigen curve. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, yeah, I mean, the point is you want a Galois representation, you need to compare it to something that naturally carries one and atal cohomology is, is somehow the right thing for this. And also there is all these work of Skinner, Urban, and there are people looking at the Ziegel and Piatti L functions for other, I mean, higher group, I mean, higher L functions, zeta functions. Yeah. Is there any, I mean, hope of doing these things further on? I mean, with those data functions or? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, in principle, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, that says you shouldn't be able to do that. I think the problem maybe is more that the, like, yeah, something that I, I kind of hid and didn't really say too much about was the fact that I'm, I'm taking the normalization of this new part of the Eigen curve and I'm getting a smooth rigid curve. Um, and smoothness is somehow really important for, for technical reasons to make the, some of the statements work. I mean. I think the problem is that like, so in general, like if you take a reductive group and you, uh, if you take a reductive group, you can define a, an Eigen variety, which is, you know, some higher dimensional version of an Eigen curve. But I think, I mean, the geometry of the Eigen curve is sort of the best understood uh, Eigen variety in the sense that we know it's, you know, it's, it's some equidimensional thing. It's dimension one uh, near the boundary. It has a really nice form in the middle. It's complicated, but it, you know, it's still a one dimensional thing, but I think in general, like, it's not known, like especially for groups that don't admit discrete series, um, it's not known that the eigenvariety that you get should be equi. I, I don't think the eigenvariety that you get should be equidimensional. So like the geometry becomes more complicated is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Um, but I think in principle, some more complicated statement should maybe be true. And if you restrict to like a locus where you know things are equidimensional and, and the geometry is simpler in a generalized eigenvariety, then you could probably take this formalism and and you, you would need some version of Achler Shimura, right? I mean, for your own yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I mean, for the, any of this to work, you have to be able to <laughs> associate Galois representations to yeah. classical and then overconvergent automorphic forms as well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. So, for the <clears throat> uh, parallel theory of a characteristic P, is that uh, a well established? I, I just imagine that. Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea about this, but just to be very curious. Because you mentioned about uh, uh, at this slice, Andreada, Ivata, uh, yeah. Polony, uh, what what, uh, what the character P uh, theory means basically. 
Yeah, right. So, I mean, so the idea, I mean, the idea is that in like, so, okay, first of all, let me just say what's done in the literature. So Andreato, Iovita, and Piloni, they construct in their paper an extension of the characteristic zero eigencurve into mixed characteristic. So in other words, they, they construct a space using similar methods to Coleman and Mazur, but that in the construction sort of includes points whose residue field is in characteristic P. And when I say mixed characteristic, I mean that these are analytic attic spaces over ZP. Um, ah. So that's what these objects literally are. Uh, yeah, so these were defined by Andreato, Iovita, and Piloni for the, for the eigen curve. And then Johansson and Newton and Gulota um, generalized this to eigen varieties for arbitrary reductive groups. Um, uh, they, it, it, it does not have a, a parallel theory of the uh, function field because you, you're talking about the boundary thing, something blah, blah. I'm, I'm thinking that if it would be some kind of you want to say, some, uh, main, contract, main contractor over the function field, maybe that is uh, your connection to such kind of stuff. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, some somehow the... I think the difference. So yeah, I, I think I get what you're asking. I think I think the difference is that you're you're, you're like the Galois group that you're looking at over these over these um, characteristic p points is still the Galois group of a number field, right? It's it's like yeah. yeah I mean, if, if the, everything is in the characteristic p, say for example, I have a function field, I have a yeah. modular form or function field, I ask a similar group of function field, and uh, you know. You're right now. Your boundary point. You you also construct something like a function field, right? So there could be something there, but I, I'm not sure. I'm really think, very very weak to have. I think Ashwin. Point. I think Ashwin is saying that um, you're you're varying the coefficients of the Galois representations, not the not the group. Uh, so oh, the oh, coefficients oh, are now like oh, yeah. are characteristic yes, but sorry, t -adic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the to totally different kind of animals. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, really, somehow you're working in the number field setting, but with mixed yeah. character coefficients. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Like, maybe there is some connection. Because um, I mean, these, you know, these modular forms, they do have perfectoid properties, but the tilting is done in the coefficients and not in the Galois group somehow. So, I, yeah, it's not clear to me. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any obvious reason why it should be related to the function field story um, per se. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. All right, do we have other questions? All right, let's um, what's send the, what's it? Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, what is lost when you take divisors? Is there, like, is there expected to be anything interesting happening there? Or, like, at various points, you're, you're taking, like, um, you're replacing modules with their kind of di the corresponding divisors, characteristic divisors. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, let me think. So, so okay, on the analytic side, you're losing information about the values of p at a kill function. You're only retaining information about their zeros. And this is sort of reflected in the fact that in the conjecture, I said that everything was kind of up to a unit. Um, mm -hmm. On the algebraic side, Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, like, okay, let, let, let's say you don't take a geometric perspective um, and you just do everything sort of for ordinary forms in the way that people usually do, which is to consider lambda modules where lambda is the Iwa style algebra. Then any torsion lambda module is pseudo isomorphic to like a, like a, a simpler one, <laughs> which means that it, there's an isomorphism to like the, the product of like very simple torsion modules like given by these mm. four primes. And then the yeah. kernel and co-kernel are killed by, or sorry, they localize to zero at every height one prime. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. Yeah, so the divisor somehow is is the information of this this sort of simpler torsion module. But I'm not sure what information is really kept in the kernel and co-kernel. Um, and I'm not sure whether it's the case that like values of the L function, which you lose on the analytic side, really somehow have some counterpart um, in the algebraic theory. But um, I mean, maybe one thing to say is that you, like in the ordinary case, um, if you're working with lambda modules and you know, you're know you really somehow working integrally, like in the Hita family case, um, you have information about the power of P dividing the, the P attic L function, right? So like, I mean, that's one mm -hmm. thing that you kind of lose when you when you take the, when you, when you go to the geometric like rigid space perspective or even the pseudo rigid perspective, you lose that. But um, 
yeah, yeah, that's that's what I think you you kind of lose. Okay. All right, do we have more questions? All right, that's successful. That's all.